Welcome to Gray Matter, the podcast from Greylock, where we share inspiring stories from today's most insightful company builders. I'm Elisa Schreiber, a partner at Greylock and an advisory board member at Allraise. Today, we are having a conversation about race and career mobility in the technology industry. The venture-backed startup ecosystem is arguably the epicenter of wealth creation and, unfortunately, the epicenter of wealth disparity. The fact is that Black, Latinx, and Native American people have largely been left out as founders, early employees, and funders. Changing this reality is the mission of John Rice, who is the founder of career advancement nonprofit Management Leadership of Tomorrow, also known as MLT. John is joining us today on Gray Matter, along with David Z, my partner at Greylock. Our two organizations have launched a broad partnership in effort to accelerate the change for people of color in the venture capital and tech startup ecosystem. Diversifying tech and venture capital is a complex undertaking, and this partnership is just a start towards the much needed progress. But John and David already have a lot of ideas that they're ready to talk about today. Thanks for listening. We're going to get into the specifics on that partnership in just a little bit. But before we dig in on that, John, I would love to start with you. Can you give us an overview of your background and really what brought you to start MLT? Thank you, Elisa and and Dave. It's great to uh, spend some time with you on on this podcast. You know, there are probably two versions of of the journey in, in starting and building MLT. And one would be that over the course of 10 years after business school, Working at the Walt Disney Company and later at the as an executive at the National Basketball Association, I, through my own experience and uh, mentoring and supporting other folks of color along the way, I thought there was a real opportunity and need to to build a nonprofit that would expand the pipeline of people of color growing in, toward leadership positions uh, across the private and, and social sectors. And it actually is true that like many of Greylock's startups, I actually formally launched MLT out of my home in Burlingame over 15 years ago. But the reality is the other side of the story, the reality is that I've been working on this idea and refining it since I was a kid growing up in Washington, D.C., watching my mother dedicate her career to passing legislation, actually the Pell Grant legislation that enabled millions of low-income and minority students to afford college. And I knew as a kid that I needed to dedicate my career to something that would build upon her work. And then In my own experience uh, coming out of college and heading to business school, I made a number of mistakes, navigational mistakes, because I had no one to to tell me what the bar was to get a job in a lot of the areas that folks were going into, like consulting and banking, and how to approach applying to business school. Even though my parents were highly educated, their careers were not in the areas that they were largely in the public sector, and, and they actually couldn't give me the playbook. And so I was lucky enough to not get too off track, but when I got to business school and I realized that there were so few people of color there uh, with me experiencing what was a transformative experience for me. Uh, I realized that you know if I had made so many mistakes along the pipeline, just to, you know coming out of college uh, to the workforce, going back to grad school, that there had to be so many other folks who didn't have the opportunities that I had growing up, that didn't have parents who went to college, that had to be making so many more mistakes, and that was really you know the reason why there are so few folks there of color. And so uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to meet some of the amazing folks that were coming to recruit and speak at these business schools. So that really started me on that path, you know, to create a better mousetrap for developing people of color through their academic and career potential, you know, that filled the gaps in exposure and social capital to help them understand the bar that would help them. And then also help institutions, which are really important pathways in our society for economic and career mobility, help them do more winning things to widen the road for people of color. Tell me a little bit about the state admission of MLT and give us a sense of the organization today, how big it is, how many people are there working full time. At MLT, we focus on impact across three spheres. The first one is expanding economic mobility for low and moderate income college students and really focusing that last mile toward economic mobility from that really is that the college to career transition where right now over 60% of Black and Latinx four-year college graduates are not getting jobs that uh, require a college degree. So we're focused on expanding the economic mobility for low- and moderate-income college students. We focus on that college and career transition. The second sphere of our work is really focused on developing a 1,000 high-impact leaders across 
uh, the private and social sectors. And then the third sphere that we focus on is diversifying institutions and helping them widen the road uh, for for more access and success for people of color because they're important pathways, uh, the most important pathways in our nation for a career and economic mobility. As I mentioned, we've been at it for more than 15 years and we've had great results and got to a, a meaningful scale, uh, although I still think we're, we're still scratching the surface. And we're about at the scale of a mid-sized university, working with about 2,000 students a year, over 10,000 to date. And our programs cut across, you know, college to early career. We have a graduate level program. We have a mid-career uh, set of programs. And uh, we work with about a 130 institutions, leading companies across all key sectors of our economy. We're about 100 staff. And we're very excited to be placing 98% of our minority college students in jobs coming out of college that average 70 plus K a year in starting salary. And for folks who are, you know, Pell eligible students, most of our, uh, our folks, that's, you know, who are making, who are coming from families of 50 K and below, that's immediately game changing. We're excited that 75% of the folks that go through our mid-career programs that really focus on making that turn to, so that you're squarely in the path to senior management, uh, 75% of those folks are getting promoted within a year coming out of our programs. And, and that, you know, if you go to Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, Kellogg, you know, a lot of basically most of the top 10 business schools, uh, about 50% of black and Hispanic uh, MBAs at those schools are graduates of our MBA prep program. When I hear about all the incredible growth and impact that you've had to date with MLT, and then I hear people talk about a pipeline problem, it makes it really hard for me to grok how those two ideas can coexist. <laughs> can you um, let me know how you react or respond when you hear folks talk about a pipeline problem in terms of recruitment of people of color? So folks that know me well know that I'm very passionate about talking about pipeline. And I think this has been a multi-decade mission of mine to put that pipeline narrative to rest. I like to talk about it because you hear very smart, highly respected executives across all sectors, whether it's technology, you heard it just in the last few days with a very senior executive in the financial services space talking about the pipeline of qualified minorities uh, and had to walk that back. And so one of the problems that we have as it relates to our journey on diversity inclusion is to help executives, okay, and I'm largely talking about white executives here, but it's really everybody, would be extremely well-informed about Two things. One is the contours of the of the the talent recruitment pipeline. The other one is actually how different the experience is within our organizations. If you're a person of color relative to uh, you know one of your your white peers, and and we we are missing fundamentally not well informed about either of those things. And and when I continue to hear the most admired CEOs talk about, for example, in the tech sector, you know, well we can't move the needle in tech until we go really far back in the pipeline and address high school STEM education or first generation college students. And I say, no, time out. Okay, well, to be well informed, all you have to do is go to the National Science Foundation website and look at their data and you'll see that 22% of all the BS degrees granted in 2015 in computer science, in engineering, and in math were granted to Blacks and Hispanics. And more importantly, that number equates to 50,000 BS degrees. So if you look at the last five years, okay, assuming 50,000 each year, and I'm sure it's higher than that, that's 250,000 degrees granted to African-Americans and Latinx college grads, right, in those three areas. So we know the pipeline is there, okay, and the similar narrative in financial services and, and, and other areas. The pipeline is there. Yes, do we have to expand the pipeline? Yes, do we have to. Uh, do we need more folks at the mid levels? Yes, okay. Uh, but but there is a big enough pipeline of fantastic talent today uh, that there is no excuse for us to be where we are as it relates to uh, our hiring and our development of tech. In this example, technical talent of color, and for for the tech sector in particular. And so that one that gives me optimism. Okay, but two, it frames the importance, I should say, it, it speaks to the importance of reframing the problem, at least. Okay, and this is not a pipeline problem. This is actually a network app, an information and relationship and exposure asymmetry. Uh, and 
that gives me optimism, actually more optimism, that we can move the needle much more quickly than you are hearing in the rhetoric that most of our senior executives continue to spread. I was going to hop in and maybe throw in one yeah. other comment there. So, look, you know, having spent time with Johnny and looked at this, you know, whenever I hear someone say there's a pipeline problem, I agree. You know, I hear what he says, which is, look, if there's a pipeline problem, it's not that there isn't enough talent out there. It's that it's on us to figure out how to create that pipeline to that talent to get it into the right places, into the right networks. That's what the pipeline problem is. When someone says a pipeline problem, when CEO of a major financial organization says it's a pipeline, they should be looking at it themselves because they're the pipeline problem. The pipeline problem isn't the, on the other side. It isn't on the supply side. It's on the demand side. It's about creating the systems to allow those networks to build. And, and Dave, how many times, you know, have, when you've heard that, has the person who said it followed up that statement with a quantitative assessment of that pipeline? I've never heard it once, right? Rarely. So I love to hear it. It actually isn't there. And if we're going to move the needle, if we're going to make advancements uh, around racial equity, you know, wealth gaps, in this important moment in our country's history, we've got to be grounded in the contours of the problem, why we are where we are. We have to be well-informed. There would be, You would never get away with not being well-informed about the impact of AI on your investments and uh, you know on your portfolio and then how you're thinking about the future in, of innovation. Financial services executives would never say, I don't really need to know anything about Bitcoin. That's not, that's an emerging thing. That, you know, uh, leave that to somebody else. But when it comes to these issues, talent, what's more important than talent? The contours of the talent pipeline, the emerging issues in DNI, the diverse uh, talent experience and how it's different, we need to call on folks to be well informed. And you want some statistics. I mean, you've brought these to my attention and they're just stunning to me. The impact of not doing that, we have a situation where we have black college graduates with a median net worth 18% of white college grads in the United States and $30,000 less than white non-college grads. And so those are the kind of statistics that are the real problems and those are the statistics that should be highlighted. Once a person of color has joined a company, what are some of the things that the companies need to consider in terms of making sure that they're able to retain the talent and ensure that they're successful in the role? You're hitting on two elements. And this, again, we talk about a being well-informed and a comprehensive approach. If you're going to span the leadership pipeline, you know, there are two levers, the lever on the way in, the recruitment pipeline, and, and how you're advancing talent that you have. And we talked about the, the recruiting piece, the talent pipeline, but there's something also that we're missing that's critically important that relates to how we as people of color experience organizations very differently than our white peers, even when we went to the same schools, whether colleges or, uh, or prep schools or have you know, similar backgrounds. Okay, as we go from meeting to meeting, when we're one of one or one of a few, twirling around questions in our head, do I measure up? How am I being perceived? If I make a mistake, does it reflect on not just me, but the other people of color? You know, why are there so few people of color in the organization? And in some of these questions, you know, am I being treated differently? Well, actually, the answers to the questions are actually, you know, uh, not really important. Uh, in many cases, you're not being treated differently, but if you perceive that you are, it's distracting. And you can imagine those two things within the context of the tech sector and the entrepreneurial ecosystem are deeply problematic. But also in any environment, when you get constructive feedback, someone comes to you and pulls you aside and, and is candid enough to say, hey, you know, you need to work on these things. You don't know where that's coming from a position of trying to, to build you up, take the next level or cut you off at the knees. And then when someone is actually reaching out to, uh, to provide some advice and mentoring, you're not sure you're, you're, you're much more hesitant relative to your ability to trust that person. And I use the example that, that sort of in the world of employer America, we all know that there's, you know, there's importance of mentoring and sponsorship, right? But when you are dealing with the issues that I described, you, what you need is actually a base level below the mentoring and sponsorship that focuses on high accountability, safe place coaching, the kind of coaching you get in the sports world. And you can imagine, now you've probably been in this situation at least once yourself, where you're in a meeting and you think you've got an insightful point that will advance the conversation at least, and you think it's maybe 30% chance is probably a, you know, not a good point. But you raise your hand, you're brave, you say, yeah, here's what I think we should do. And then the, the room, who's, you know, when, if you're the only woman in that room, everyone sort of reacts sort of sideways. And then five minutes later, some guy raises his hand and says the exact same thing, right? And everyone says, yes, let's go do that, right? And then you're asking yourself, hey, uh, what just happened there, right? And then you have to go back to your office and say, uh, ask yourself, well, how do I regroup? How do I go back to my manager and get feedback? 
And so this is the kind of thing that a mentor who a sage mentor, or the best mentor meets with you, you know, once a month or once a quarter, they can't be around to help you with that. They don't know you well enough. They can't, they don't have the frequency. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that's happening every time, uh, oh, happen, happening all the time. And it speaks to the importance of sports like coaching in addition to mentoring and sponsorship that are really important to move the, the kinds of interventions that are really important. But in the professional world, you don't get that kind of coaching unless you're already a senior executive, which is problematic, if, especially problematic if you're a person of color. You touched on a lot there. And one of the points you made was specifically around the tech and startup ecosystem. And I'd like to dig in there. Um, that's clearly the area that this relationship with Greylock and MLT is going to focus on. And I think it's worth unpacking a bit some of the unique and systemic issues that people of color face when they're making a decision about whether or not to join an early stage startup, you know, coming out of business school or coming out of college. Can you share a little bit about that? I think our listeners would really appreciate understanding some of the dynamics that go into that decision making. I want to address that uh, maybe on, on two levels. Um, the first one, I could probably share my own experience, okay? And I mentioned that you know, I was not a first-generation college student, but my parents were largely, you know, made their careers in the public government sector, ed sector, and they really didn't have the answers for me, okay, in terms of what's the bar to get into the tech sector, what, how to think about opportunities. And so many other folks are in the same boat. If you're a first-generation college student, right, and you have loans and you know, you're in debt, whether you're coming out of college or even more so out of graduate school, uh, and you think about the, the tech ecosystem, the vibrant, dynamic, entrepreneurial world that is the you know, tech venture you know, in growth equity ecosystem, that's very disconnected. I'll give you an example. I went to a conference. It was a, maybe 10 years ago, okay, at the Black MBA Association. It was a career fair for Black MBAs. And large companies with these big booths and everyone's there talking, sharing their resumes, trying to set up interviews. And there was Facebook in this tiny booth, okay? And not very well positioned in the room. Um, but regardless, and there were about literally, you know, five people in the line, okay? And meaning no one was focused on actually pursuing careers at Facebook. They didn't really understand it as an employer brand. Yes, many of them were already on it in, as users. But the point is, you know, that there's a combination of a lack of exposure, a relationship asymmetry. You just, we don't see people who are senior in the world of tech, okay? Uh, we don't see any black and Hispanic Dave Z's, okay? We don't know the folks who work for those folks. And so the, L, the perspective around risk, not a household name, okay? And emerging company, entrepreneurial ecosystem, but without the relationships, without the role models, and without a high touch outreach engagement model from the tech ecosystem coming to me, similar to the way the banks and consulting firms and others are coming uh, in major, you know, uh, Fortune 500 companies, it just it doesn't work. You know, people who are engineers, people who are computer science undergrads who fashion themselves as entrepreneurs, okay, they're finding other paths and, and it's very addressable and it requires work on both ends. You know, institutions need to take a totally different approach, you know, the ecosystem itself leaders and then individuals, we, you know, we have to lower the perceived risks. You do that through relationships, you, you do that through exposure. I think that's a great segue into getting into some of the meat around the partnership between MLT and Greylock. And I'd like to actually kick it over to you, David, to just share a little bit about how, you know, this relationship got started and then talk a little bit about the details of how we're going to be working together. Well, great. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. So, you know, I've been lucky enough to know Johnny since our college days together and we've kept in touch over the years. And um, recently he uh, came to me when they were looking to expand their presence in the Valley and uh, increase uh, sort of their focus on opportunities in the tech space. And that was sort of probably the initial seed of the idea. But, you know, recent events have really kicked things forward in our mind. And we've been very focused on how do we try to do some things that will make a difference in the ecosystem over time. And internally in Greylock, we had been working on a whole bunch of lists and a bunch of areas to work on. So I'd reached back out to Johnny and talked about how we can work together. And it's amazing how much MLT's work lines up with all the things that we've been trying to do. So for example, we have a group in Greylock that is called Core Talent that focuses on hiring out of universities and then up through VP in 
primarily design and engineering and product among other functions. And Johnny, as he just mentioned, his whole group at MLT is focused on how do we get talent exposed to those opportunities. And so we're going to lock those teams together and they're working on setting down how they're going to work together, what their goals and metrics are going to be, and how we're going to get MLT's alumni and MLT fellows uh, into Greylock companies, exposed to Greylock companies, exposed to other companies in the Valley. We have an executive team function that does executive recruiting. And they also are connected with members in Johnny's team working on looking at the rising leader alumni network that Johnny has over the years, the 9,000 plus people and the ones that are relevant in tech companies that we should be working with to help get into our companies, to help our companies be much more successful by integrating and working with them. You know, and then we're you know, going to help them to understand the playbook of how startups think about hiring, how they look at how the interview process, what are the skills they're looking for, and how do we mesh with the programs and systems that MLT has built and provide a view from the Valley on how that works from our perspective so that we can make um, success happen for both of us. Um, another way that Greylock wants to work with MLT is you know, navigating and understanding how to work with raising funds, whether that's with the VCs like the Greylock or with the accelerator and incubator environments, which have exploded over the last decade. And again, that also is a system that is completely opaque if you come from the outside. And we can be very helpful in understanding, giving them a sense of what's the playbooks, what are the bars, what are the ways you think about positioning yourself, what are the ways you communicate, and what are people looking for? We have a lot of experience, obviously, that with that with our tech startups. And now we're going to apply that to work with the MLT team. And then lastly, I think um, you know, we will connect uh, and support MLT talent interested in pursuing careers in venture capital, another world that is very opaque and is very unclear, and probably the most opaque and the least clear of how you get a role and, and having the least roles available, period. And it's very somewhat ad hoc and, and not um, specific in how it's uh, navigated. And so uh, one of our goals is to work with uh, the MLT team to help expand our network of talent and we hope at Greylock to have goals for ourselves in terms of um, bringing people of color into our team, but also exposing um, talents to other VCs and other um, funders around uh, the Valley to let them you know, expand as well. So it's not, this isn't really about Greylock, honestly, this is about MLT and this is about creating access and opportunity. And we're taking a first step to help you know, grease the wheels and create some systems to help support that. But we want everyone to be involved and we want everyone to make this successful because it's really about how do we work to change the trajectory so that 10 years we look back and can feel really happy about uh, the impact that it's had. I can testify to the enthusiasm of the partnership around this work that we're doing with MLT and, and diversifying our LP base. I'm wondering if you can just expand on why it is a priority for Greylock to commit time and energy to this kind of initiative and why you picked up the phone and called Johnny and knew he would be the right partner for moving this forward. First of all, you know, shame on us for not having done this earlier, period. Um, that's just the reality of the situation. But the other reality is, you know, big moments of systematic change usually come about because of catalyzing events. And clearly, there are large injustices that have been existing for a long while that have come to the forefront in American life and are now causing catalyzing events here. And that really unique energy has gripped our country, but it's also gripped Greylock. The team really wanted to do something meaningful and proactive. We didn't want to just put out a corporate statement that had no teeth. And, and we have a lot of work to do. And the partnership is committing to doing the work. And the energy is coming from every vector, from investing partners, sending notes to me about ideas and how to work and help and work with MLT, to our operating team, you know, sending notes about how excited they are about engaging and having metrics for themselves that are not only about the number of folks that they place in our startups, but also now the number of MLT fellows and MLT teams members that they can place into a into the systems. And so there's a lot of energy. And of course, we're not the only ones working on this issue. And there's lots of, of different kinds of programs going on. And we need lots of different kinds of programs. This is about, you know, how do we have everyone doing as many things as we can to try to make a difference and lay lots of seeds and, and try to, you know, see what will grow and what will flourish. And, um, you know, it's fantastic that so many people have dug in to work on this, both inside Greylock and I believe across the industry. And now we just need to keep doing the hard work. Yes, we're going to keep doing the hard work together. And we feel like we've got a really strong foundation to build this partnership on top of it. And, and thanks to the hard work of my team over at MLT and our very 
scrappy ML tiers. And we've already got 1,700 uh, uh, ML tiers who are working in the tech sector. You know, we got almost 60, 50, you know, maybe 60 plus working in, you know, who are at in venture capital. Uh, and I think five firms, five venture firms just within the last few years have been founded uh, by MLT rising leaders who have raised a combined, you know, almost $350 million. So we've got a starting point, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we all feel confident that we can build uh, upon this foundation. And if we just apply our respective competencies and energy to this, this ecosystem can look completely different in five years and totally different in seven to 10 years. David, you mentioned that you went to college with John and that's how you know each other. Can you tell me a little bit more about just some color around how the idea for the broader partnership came together? Yeah, so John and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, we met in the late 80s in college together and uh, have, uh, you know, became friends there and spent time together. Over the years, um, we've kept in touch um, through his founding of MLT and through me joining a bunch of startups and then Greylock back in 2000. And then, you know, we, more recently, we've both uh, gone on the board of trustees of our alma mater. And so we've spent a lot of time together there. And so there's really a long history. Um, and that long history has built up a lot of trust and a lot of understanding. I've always admired Johnny and what he's done at MLT. And that allowed us, as we were looking to figure out how to create um, some action around impact uh, around our diversity uh, and inclusion initiatives at Greylock. It allowed us to quickly reconnect and really sort of fast track the entire process because of the trust and because of the deep understanding that Johnny had of Greylock and, and, and that I had of MLT. Um, and so it made it really possible for us to, to do this and take hopefully what is a, some big swings together um, and do it in, in, in very short order. Our relationship is an example of the power that folks who have kind of a shared vision, you know, who are, who are fired up to attack problems and who, who have a level of comfort with each other, the, the kinds of things that can, can take place at important moments in time. And I think that that speaks to both the opportunity that we have jointly here in the tech ecosystem to facilitate the uh, kinds of relationships that are important uh, well before you know a deal happens or a hire or an offer happens. We've got to work hard to expand networks and facilitate trusted relationships between very, very talented people of color and very, very, very talented people who have been in this ecosystem for a long time. And I think the ironic thing is that, you know, for me is that just a stroke of luck that David and I ended up in the same class in college and freshman year in the same dorm and four years in the same, essentially dorm, we used to call it a residential college, uh, and shared so many you know, uh, you know, great stories uh, in our formative years that it made it easier. But there's another side of this that's worth mentioning, which is that at some level, it took the level of trust and long-term relationship for this to happen. That is what I would call sort of uh, a lightning strike that isn't scalable or repeatable. And what we need to do to close this network gap in the tech sector is to facilitate a lot more of these relationships. So we're not expecting future lightning strikes for us to move the needle on diversity in the ecosystem. And if you go back, and I've studied this, you go back and look at some of the Black and Latinx folks who've gotten to the CEO level in our major organizations, they will almost without question share a story of something fortunate that happened to them that had nothing to do with their talent that probably shouldn't have happened, but was so critical to them turning the corner to be on the path to uh, that senior executive and CEO level. And I remember reading a piece about uh, Xerox's former CEO, Ursula Burns, who talked about walking down the hallway, I think it was, and heading toward the cafeteria, and some older white gentleman sort of pulled her aside. And, uh, and this is when she's like a mid-level engineer. And he says to her, hey, you know, why don't you come over this way? And because I, I, I really like to expose you to a broader uh, part of our business, you know, all the other things that we do. And I think the story is that like she initially said, no, nah, actually, I'm not really interested in doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying being an engineer. I think I'm a good trajectory. And the gentleman said, no, 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 I've heard great things about you. You got to come this way. And she did. And, and everything changed from there. And that, you know, it, that isn't going to happen in a repeatable way. So we've got to take the responsibility to 
turn what has been lightning strikes, okay, for the for the very few people of color that have made it to the executive roles and who have started companies, who have gotten into venture firms, you know, turn that into a, 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 a repeatable ecosystem that looks like the, the kinds of very high, high leverage networks that are, that the Valley is really built upon. And, and look, as, as Johnny talks about this, it so much rings of truth of what goes on in the Valley today already. If you aren't in the collision points that so many people in Silicon Valley have access to, you know, the network of having worked at a Facebook or a LinkedIn or having gone to Stanford, it could take a massive stroke of luck for someone to find and build powerful networks. And, and in, the, in the Valley, we talk so much about you know, social networks. We talk about network graphs. We talk about social capital and social proof as ways to increase trust and to move quickly. And so if you don't have access and you aren't integrated into those, it is like the random lightning strike. And instead we need to turn it into so much access that we have chances for these collisions to happen all the time, that it's more like a large electrical storm where these kind of things are happening. Right now that's happening in the Valley for you know white males, primarily. And we need to increase that so that we have access to people who have color so that they can be part of these networks. Today, you see, you're going to see alumni from Airbnb and Stripe and other high growth startup companies found the next generation startups. And you'll see VCs eager to back those teams and, and recruit from them, you know, as investors, because that's the network that's been built. That's how the Valley works. And it's crucial to make sure that people of color are included in that entire flow as early employees at breakout companies and as potential investors downstream as well. If I could just jump in on that, I, I, that resonates so deeply with me. And it reminds me of when I was in the early days of MLT, to, and I can't remember, it was maybe 206, 207, to late, and I came across an article in the New York Times, and the title was "It Pays to Have Pals in Silicon Valley," and it talked about exactly what Dave just described. And then there was this graph, okay, this chart that you know, of ironically, coincidentally, Reed Hoffman, Dave's partner, was uh, on, you know, a member of this chart. And it talked about the cohesive network that emanated from PayPal to so many other organizations in. Uh, whether they're tech companies, other VC firms, even hedge funds, I was just floored by this concept. And I had that article, I've had it in my briefcase literally, you know, for probably two years. And every time I got and talked to somebody like Dave, you know, um, you know Silicon Valley veterans and, and talk about MLT and say, I would say, this is what we are trying to create, right? You know, and I, I would say to them, look, you know, I remember going to my board and saying, look, if just one of these folks on this graph, okay, was African-American or Hispanic, a person of color, think how much would be different in the Valley today in terms of people of color led startups being funded by venture firms, investors uh, at venture firms, executives at operating companies, even philanthropy in our most vulnerable communities. That's the power of these networks. And it goes well beyond a near-term transaction. It's the kind of thing that we need to recreate with people of color in it, and that widens the road. That widens the pot for everybody, and I think that's the model. What Dave described is really the model of where we're trying to go. And so we we figure we know what that model is. Now we just need to to expand it and replicate it for uh, to include people of color. And look, we've been lucky enough at Greylock to be involved in a bunch of social networks, and so we understand how this works, and it puts an onus on us, we believe, to really engage in this and try to be part of making a difference. I think it's also important to note that this is early. And there's a lot of hard work to do. We are, our industry, whether you say technology writ large, whether you say startups, or whether you say the VC industry uh, is another sub-segment, we're all pathetically bad at this. It's it's unacceptable where we are. And we're eager to work with other uh, VC firms and startups in the industry to help move this forward in the right way. It's not going to be about Greylock, uh, you know, changing the world. This has got to be, how do we as an industry work together, how do we find great organizations like MLT to engage and bring into our network, to expand our networks and to really change this dynamic that we're talking about? Yeah, but uh, Dave, I think, you know, I got I know you're a very humble guy, you know, but, uh, but I will say too humble in this case, because you all are, you know, best in class, world-class, maybe the best in the world as it relates to how to build and sustain networks, you know, and, make them work in a very high leverage way across your ecosystem. That's the kind of expertise that will be really important to move the needle and helping us figure out how to recreate these networks for people of color. Uh, So I know you like to say that, you know, you're 
Uh, I know we are early stage in, in this relationship, but I know you like to say that you all have a lot of work to do and we all have a lot of work to do, but I think that uh, I encourage you, you know, to, to be uh, less humble in this case about what you all have created because within it really lies the power of the opportunity that we have together. Well, look, I appreciate you saying that. We're excited to work with you guys, but we're also excited to introduce you and get you involved with other firms in the Valley and other startups in the Valley, because we think that's where the compounding power happens. And if my knowledge and the power of networks only is uh, captured in the fact that I know you and that I can help introduce you to a bunch of people, I will have done, uh, I think, a very good thing. So I'm really excited about working with you. MLT as part of this is also launching an impact fund. And so I wanted to hear a little bit more from you, John, about why you're raising the impact fund and what it means for MLT in the long term. It's a critically important starting point for a new and more ambitious approach to taking our work in the tech sector to the next level. And we're proud that we've laid a strong foundation, but there's a lot more work to do as a, you know, a ton more work to do as it relates to expanding the the number of black and brown founders that have access and are ready for venture investment from, from firms like Greylock. Working at places like Greylock, talent for their portfolio and those of other venture firms, uh, and even collaborations between venture firms uh, that are minority-led. We see this impact fund as a, as a way to, to, over time, really to become a capital creation vehicle to scale and supercharge our work and tackle at a different, even you know, at a much bigger level, what uh, you even referred to at least as, uh, as sort of the epicenter of wealth creation. It's also the you know, epicenter of wealth disparities. And the reason why it's important for us is that with Greylock giving us the opportunity to be an LP in, in, in their Greylock 16 fund, that creates the beginnings of a model that, that uh, Dave and his partners are so kind to help us introduce and engage with other VC and private equity firms. And if we can do that, I think we're going to have a uniquely compelling fundraising proposition for, for philanthropists and even impact investors. Think about it, you know, um, with access to the kinds of the most exclusive capital pools in the world and the ability to work, as Dave said, on all these different threads to move the needle on minority participation, racial equity and diversity and inclusion in the tech ecosystem. Think about the ability to, to go to philanthropists and impact investors and say, for every dollar that you contribute to our impact fund, that will be invested in these exclusive high, you know, four X plus returning capital pools that will create a four X impact multiplier on their contributions. And that impact multiplier will be focused on, on diversifying this tech ecosystem and attacking the opportunities to create more wealth, to create more impact in our communities, more jobs, more economic mobility for people of color. So it's a, this is a beginnings of uh, of something I'm incredibly excited about. It's a new and unique approach. It's not just about MLT or you know Greylock, and uh, you know they're they're really focused on helping us build relationships more broadly and expand you know this platform so that it really moves the needle over the next five to ten years on diversity in the tech ecosystem. And look, this has been a very energizing thing for our partnership as well. There's, you know, there's incredible enthusiasm about all the vectors of this relationship. Many of Greylock's partners personally seeded the first $5 million to anchor um, this new fund because we think it really has a force power multiplier. Um, and we look forward to you know, inviting and encouraging other great firms, other great funds around the Valley to think about working with MLT as well. Um, I'm also excited to be joining the MLT Advisory Board as part of that commitment. We've talked a little bit about having the ecosystem look different in the long term. What does success look like? How are you going to measure the progress of this partnership? We'll start with you, John. You know, you have 15 years now of working on programs to move the needle in this way in other industries. So what does success look like in the venture-backed startup ecosystem? So we're taking a long view as it relates to this partnership and as it relates to the progress that we want to see in, in the tech ecosystem. And we believe that we can actually expand our impact, our footprint uh, by five to 10 X overall. And I th think about the dimensions of that. We've got about just under 2000 folks in MLTers, people going working in tech. And we think we can take that up to 10,000. We've got about 18 startups that are funded by venture capital. We think we can take that to over 200. Uh, we've got about 300 MLTs right now who are working 
and venture capital portfolio companies. And, and we think we can 10x that to 3,000. And then the last two areas that we're going to be really focused on in terms of uh, exponential growth are the number of, of venture capital investors, as well as the number of companies that achieve a you know, billion dollar more valuation. In the venture capital space, I mentioned that we've got about 60 folks who are working in venture capital firms and about five, in, in just in the past few years, five RNLT years are leading venture capital firms that have raised a collective uh, about $350 million between them. We think we can take that number to 200. And we've got one MLT that's been a, a founder and, and built a company with a, uh, that's uh, achieved a billion dollar uh, valuation. We think we can take that to at least $10 billion, 10, one billion plus dollar uh, value companies that are worth uh, a billion or more over the next several years. So very ambitious goals. We know it's going to be a, a, a lot of work, but we also think that the path is there uh, and that working together and engaging a broader subset of like-minded leaders in the Valley that we can do that. And we think this as a, collectively will result in massive increases in economic mobility, in job creation, wealth creation, and those three things, job creation, wealth creation, economic mobility, will in turn transform philanthropy in our most vulnerable communities. And so we are focused on exponential growth. We know that's going to be hard. We also believe that this is going to lead to massive increases in economic mobility, in jobs for people of color at all levels, wealth creation, and uh, the closing of wealth gaps between people of color and their white peers. And, and I also say that it's going to be really important as it relates to transforming philanthropy in our most vulnerable communities. And look, I think the good news is, as it should be in a partnership, our goals mirror their goals. Um, you know, in the short term, I think it's about getting our groups together and lining up the places where our operations match and setting up the specific KPIs uh, to really start chipping away and creating progress. You know, placing people inside um, our, our companies, exposing them to other opportunities if the right fit is inside our portfolio, hiring inside our own organization over time, and then increasingly densifying the networks and the exposure to networks, the lightning storms that we talked about, you know, creating the density of social capital and, and network density that really leads to great outcomes in the longer term. And I think in the longer term, again, ideally, we hopefully should look back on this work and the work that other people are doing with pride because hopefully it leads to many black, Latinx, and Native American founders building billion dollar companies something that we have not seen and we need to see. And the workforces at those companies need to re better reflect the actual demographics of our country. So this is the hard work that needs to be done by us and others, and it's gonna got to have to start now, and it's gonna take time. But I think, you know, I'm really excited that over the long term, there's an opportunity to make a significant difference. That's fantastic. Thank you both so much for um, all of this. If folks are listening to this podcast and they wanna get more involved, how would you direct them to get more involved? And I guess I'll start with you, John. We love to begin that engagement. You know, we're at mlt.org and, and we can learn more about our programs, our comprehensive work across the, you know, at, with individuals and with institutions. But I, I, I'd say, you know, the, at a higher level, if I am a well-intentioned senior executive or any person who wants to make a difference, my broader call to action, you know, at this moment in our country, if you're uh, connected at all to the tech ecosystem, you know, is to find a way to one get really informed about why we are where we are, and then once you feel like you're well informed, and we're very much happy to help you all, along that journey. But as you get well informed, as your confidence grows, then I, I'd also say you know take some big swings, you know, um, at at moving the needle in the things that Dave and I have been talking about today, uh, and those can be re-examining how your organization approaches your journey around racial equity and DNI. Those can be investing in organizations like ours who are ambitiously trying to move the needle or taking a little bit of time and figuring out a way to expand your professional networks enough uh, such that you can engage somebody, uh, a person of color who is trying to get into or is already in the tech ecosystem and find a way to help them close the network gap. 
I agree with everything that Johnny said, and, and I won't repeat, but I'll just say some more basic actions. Look, if you're a Greylock company uh, and you're or you're involved with Greylock, you know, reach out to Holly Rose Faith around executive recruiting and our relationship with MLT. Reach out to Glenn Evans around our core uh, rich recruiting. And look, if you're a VC firm or your firm's interested in being part of this, please reach out to us at Greylock or John at MLT. We'd love to get more fellow VCs on board with this. Thank you both so much for joining us today. This was a really important conversation and I appreciate so much your time and sharing your perspectives. Thank you so much, Elisa. Okay, everyone, that concludes this episode of Gray Matter. You can subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find new episodes and blogs on our website at graylock.com. Please follow us on Twitter at graylockvc. I'm Elisa Schreiber, and thanks so much for listening.